All right. Well, welcome everybody to an evening with Phil Brown presenting North of the Notches, the great North Woods of New Hampshire, uh, along with the, the Harris Center. Uh, the Harris Center is a conservation organization here in the Monadnock region of Southern New Hampshire. And um, I'll let Phil take it from there. Okay, yeah. I'll, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about myself and my connection to the Harris Center initially. Um, I am an employee of the Harris Center on a part-time basis. I'm the Hawk Watch Coordinator. Um, and some of you may know me from the Pac Monadnock Raptor Observatory up at Miller State Park in Peterborough. Uh, the Harris Center and New Hampshire Audubon partner to um, carry on a, uh, a raptor migration monitoring station there. And, uh, and we do a lot of education as well. We are hoping to be there this fall. Um, it's been a wacky year, of course, but we're going to do everything we can to maintain our, our counts uh, for this, the um, 16th consecutive year at Pac Monadnock. So um, uh, hopefully I'll see some of you up there. But I'm not here to talk about the Monadnock region tonight at all. Uh, I'm going to be talking about a place uh, quite a bit further away and maybe a little bit of an exotic destination for many of you. All right, so yeah, let's jump right into it. The land of the pointy trees. Um, there are a lot of names for this part of the state, but uh, generally when I'm uh, talking about North of the Notches, um, uh, we're talking about Coas County. It's another uh, area uh, synonymous with with uh, the part of the state that I'm going to be talking about and a little bit of my personal background with this part of the state. Um, I guess initially I, I came up to New Hampshire to uh, on a hiking trip in college from New Jersey. Got to hike Mount Washington in the winter and that was a pretty thrilling experience being on the highest point in the Northeast. Um, but it was it was several years later after college that I first discovered the real North Woods, um, generally north of the White Mountains. Um, on a trip to uh, a place called Pondicherry. Um, some of you may know of Pondicherry. It's a wildlife refuge uh, in the Mount Washington uh, Valley on the west side of Mount Washington um, between Mount Washington and the Connecticut River. And it was um, just a little known place back then, only about 16, 17 years ago. Um, but it has taken off and uh, has had a success story of conservation partnerships and um, uh, and wildlife success stories that I'll tell you a little bit about in this program. So it was um, upon that trip I realized I fell in love with New Hampshire and the great North Woods and uh, shortly after that I applied for a job as the um, sanctuaries manager at New Hampshire Audubon and that's where I still am um, on a um, most of the time basis uh, with New Hampshire Audubon as the director of land management. So it was Pondicherry that, that really drew me to the state. And, um, uh, and ever since that winter, the first year that I was in New Hampshire in 2004, I started um, a, a tradition. I didn't know it would be a tradition at the time, but it became the tradition of the North Country um, Pittsburgh and Errol Christmas bird counts, which are, as some of you may know, the, the oldest citizen science projects uh, in the United States, the oldest citizen science project. And um, this is a way for people to go out all day in a given area, count every bird, every individual they see, and tally it as part of a, as what started with a national effort in the year 1900. Um, now, 120 years later, it's still going on, and there are thousands and thousands of count circles all around the world. So it's been a, a and an excellent way to document bird populations. Um, so here we are this many years later, this coming winter, I'm hoping to go back for my 17th annual Pittsburgh and Errol Counts. Um, now I'm the coordinator of the Pittsburgh Count um, for the last several years. That bird count has been going on since 1950. And when you go north in the winter, you don't necessarily think of a lot of birds. These are some empty, open landscapes and even the woods, pretty quiet a lot of the time. Um, but what we really go up there is, is for the, uh, the quality and not necessarily the quantity. Um, so I'll get into some of that in the coming photos here. So here's a, an image of the Christmas bird count in action. Typical scene, this is Third Connecticut Lake. 
And, um, and it wasn't just uh, in winter that uh, it drew me up here, but on spring trips too, I got excited about going north in the spring uh, to see the, some of the rare breeding birds, especially. This is actually a photo on the right here of the spring. This was a late May day on the fourth Connecticut Lake Trail, which maybe some of you have heard of this, this location. It's right on the border uh, of Canada. Some parts of this trail actually cross into Canada and the trailhead is beyond the border station. You have to check in with the border station and walk around it in order to get to the trailhead. So it's a pretty exciting experience to get on this trail and you can hike up to the headwaters of the Connecticut River. Um, and that's where uh, a couple of these uh, images were taken. Um, some of the, the interesting species here uh, on the top left is a black-backed woodpecker, a bird that you can only find by going to the White Mountains and further north. And on the bottom left, this is the spruce grouse, which I'll tell you a little bit about the, uh, um, the grouse, the differences between the uh, spruce and the rough later on. So these are what draws birders uh, up to Pittsburgh in particular. Pittsburgh is the township. Um, so few years after that, I, I got interested in sharing this a little bit more widely with people and um, we developed a uh, New Hampshire Audubon field trip that lasted several days. Uh, I think 2014 was the first year. So we picked a, a good time during breeding season to show showcase some of the, the natural beauty up there, some of the birds of the North Country. And, um, uh, and since then, since 2014, I have been leading an annual excursion to Coas County based in the town of Pittsburgh. So we do a lot of uh, trips up to the border areas looking for some of these hard to find birds. And, um, and for those who are not really um, uh, in with, with the bird watching lingo, um, bird watching and birding, I, I use those interchangeably for one. Uh, I think there's a, there is a fine distinction to those things. I personally enjoy bird watching which is really sticking with the birds. But birding, birders, are a real serious bunch in general. Um, but there's a whole gamut of, of people who practice the, the hobby of bird watching, the pastime of bird watching. And some are, are dead set on listing, finding birds that they need for their state list. So the spruce grouse and the uh, black-backed woodpecker are two that these listers will chase up to Pittsburgh for three or four hours away in order to tick this off on their on their annual list. So, uh, so that's why Pittsburgh is on the map for, for birds. Um, generally, a little bit about the geography of what I'm talking about north of the notches here. Um, I have a couple of maps here. You can see the state map on the left, which highlights Coas County in green. And um, this, this really is interchangeable with the area that I'm talking about. So Coas County, um, is, uh, is a very large part of the state. It's about the northern third of the tip of the state. Um, if you think the White Mountains is far, there's a lot more to the state. You can still drive a couple of hours to get to the Canada border. So uh, a few of the places that I'll be focused on talking about here uh, with the Blue Stars, um, starting from the south, Mount Washington, Pondicherry, we'll go up to Lake Umbagog, the Colebrook Grasslands, and of course the Connecticut lakes where a lot of my trips are based. Um, but yeah, generally this area, uh, it has borders shared with Maine to the east, Canada to the north, Vermont to the west. Um, it has uh, an industry of logging, which is, is kind of a slowly dying industry in, in many parts of the, the world, but especially up in Northern New Hampshire. Um, it hasn't been the most robust uh, for the economy of late. Um, recreation is definitely one of the key parts of, of keeping this region alive economically. So why not do some, some wildlife based recreation? There's a lot of other types of sports, fly fishing, snowmobiling, off-road vehicle use in this part of the state, uh, certainly hunting with the focus on, on moose historically, which were more common in the past. But, um, but wildlife watching, which you know a lot of people um, are partaking in, especially now, uh, it's getting a lot of attention. 
um, it's still, you know, probably a little bit more limited compared to some of those other traditional uh, tourism draws. So, um, so there's definitely a need for it. Um, and part of what makes this part of the world special, um, starting north of the notches here, is the, uh, the diversity of habitat types. Um, generally, the forest types in a lot of the higher elevations and in the, uh, the higher terrain um, away from the river valleys is going to be comprised of spruce fir forests, which is a forest type we don't see a lot of south of the White Mountains. Um, that is a big part of what draws some of the wildlife to that area. Um, certainly a lot of the birds have, have ties into the conifers uh, and can't do well elsewhere. So that's what limits the, the range of some of these species which are, are more typical of Canadian forests. So really this part of the state is, is very much like large swaths of Canada, uh, interior Quebec uh, in particular. So the diversity of habitat types, um, just looking at the montane habitats on the upper right, um, open water and uh, riverine habitats. Uh, and certainly um, uh, there's a place for open grasslands and successional areas too. And with that diversity of habitats comes a diversity of wildlife. Um, I like to say the, um, the grand slam of New Hampshire wildlife is represented in this picture. Um, it's, uh, you know, you can't go wrong with these iconic New Hampshire species, the black bear, the moose, bald eagle, and common loon. Um, so it's, it's kind of hard to beat that, but um, really, I think for me, this part of the state is, um, it's represented by lesser known wildlife species that, that really represent um, some of the connections to these landscapes. So I hope to tell you a little bit more about those here. Uh, and those include the birds that I already showed you, the grouse and the, and the um, woodpecker, but also several of the other state endangered and threatened species like the rusty blackbird and the northern harrier, um, some of the warblers and flycatchers, uh, and then some true boreal specialists like the Canada jay and the boreal chickadee. And let's not forget about mammals too. We have um, American marten and now Canada lynx, uh, in addition to bear and moose. Bill, have you led trips up there? You talked about your trips. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and I am planning to do to lead a tour to this area in late August if all goes well. And, and I have some plans that I could mention at the end of this talk about how I plan to do that in a safe way. Um, yeah, so thanks for asking. And about um, how far away is, say, Pondicherry from Peterborough in this area? Yeah, door to door, probably less than two and a half hours. Um, so Pondicherry is definitely doable as a day trip. Getting a little further out into the, the Coas County region in the far north, I'd say that's more of an overnight stay. So, um, so yeah, that's what I'll be offering uh, is a, a three night trip uh, to Pittsburgh later in August. But yeah, keep uh, keep sending questions my way since I'm I'm not seeing comments here. So thanks for passing that along. Um, let me see. So yeah, I will start with Pondicherry right after I'll, I'll show you this. So a lot of you are familiar with this view from Route 93, Franconia Notch. Um, so this is the start of the region that I'm talking about. But it's an impressive granite face with a, with a boulder field below it and sugar maple, northern hardwood forests on the slopes in the foreground, um, spruce fir forests in the upper elevations, and, and that's, that's certainly a component of the, of the north of the Notches region, but, but most of this region is less than 4,000 feet, uh, really away from the high peaks in the state. Um, you know, a lot of the region is varied between 1,000 and 3,000 feet in elevation, and there are a lot of lesser known summits, so um, Many of the peak baggers know the 48, 4,000 footers, but, um, but there are a lot of other obscure peaks that are in the three to 3,500 foot range of Goss County that are also worth a look, uh, worth exploring. Um, so that's Franconia, but yeah, here's the first stop. As we head north through Franconia Notch, uh, just a little beyond that is this little hidden gem called Pondicherry. And, uh, 
Pondicherry has an interesting history of land conservation and, uh, and wildlife protection. And it's truly a spectacular scenic spot with diverse natural areas. Um, New Hampshire Audubon purchased Pondicherry in 1962. So it, it dates way back in the early days of some of the earliest conservation parcels in that part of the state. Uh, 300 acres at the time was purchased from a logging company by Tudor Richards, who was then the, um, the first paid president of New Hampshire Audubon, um, and, and certainly a, a legend in his own right. Um, Tudor um, had become familiar with Pondicherry in the 1940s, studying ring-necked ducks and other species. I think he first found ring-necked ducks as a, a new nesting bird for the state right here at at the Cherry Ponds. This is pictured here as Cherry Pond itself. And there's also Little Cherry Pond right near it. Um, there's also a smaller pond called Mud Pond. Uh, so those three open water bodies and the surrounding forest and, and marshland comprise what is now a 6,400 acre uh, preserve. Um, but initially I think Tudor paid something like a, a dollar an acre for that land in 1962. And he, he planted the seed for what is now the spectacular place that is protected by the National Wildlife Refuge System in the, uh, as part of the Silvio Conti Refuge. So the Silvio Conti Refuge is, it's very unique in that it, it has expansion areas all within the, the watershed of the Connecticut River, the entire Connecticut River from the headwaters in northern New Hampshire down to um, the mouth in Connecticut. So it has a, a four and a half million acre um, area where it has potential to, to acquire land. So Pondicherry is in that Silvio Conti division and it's, uh, it's a real gem of a place. It's had a lot of attention lately on the trails. So it's a very accessible area and it has some true accessible trails, which is good for, for all persons really. So um, including a boardwalk and, and a short walkway. Just checking in. You hearing me okay, Miles? Loud and clear, Phil. Okay, good. There's loud and clear rain behind me, too. <laughs> All right, so um, Pondicherry was first designated as an important bird area in New Hampshire in 2004, and it became the first important bird area in the state designated by Audubon. And today there are 15 or 20 of those locations, but uh, this was due to its um, abundance of migratory and breeding birds and you know, thanks to a diversity of habitat types from uh, boreal forest to swamp to acidic fen which is the uh, the cherry pond system is a, is a fen which has a lot of typical bog plants. Um, a couple of the, uh, the folks who introduced me to this area uh, I need to point out um, um, Let's see, that's me in the middle there. We're standing in front of the Tudor Richards plaque, the Tudor Richards Memorial plaque um, at the uh, platform that's also named for him. Uh, each year, New Hampshire Audubon, except for this year, has led a, an in-person field trip in honor of Tudor, um, who, uh, who last made the trip out to the place that he protected when he was 92 years old, I believe. And he walked out two miles out to the pond and back. Um, but I'm standing with uh, uh, the, the taller gentleman on my right is David Gavatsky, who uh, uh, otherwise known as, um, as Tudor's successor in some ways as the, the protector of Pondicherry. Uh, he's a volunteer, retired forester from the White Mountain National Forest. And uh, Dave has done a lot single-handedly to, to really advance the, the conservation and stewardship of this whole region. And, even as a volunteer helping grow this refuge to 6,400 acres. And, uh, and the man on my left has had a, a similar legacy, Bob Quinn, Robert Quinn. Um, he owns and operates Merlin Wildlife Tours. Um, I've partnered with Bob on leading this Northern New Hampshire nature trip uh, several years. And, um, and he's been a, a friend and mentor for a long time as well. And he's, he did the first bird surveys that helps the, uh, the refuge um, take interest in acquiring Pondicherry. So, so Bob actually named this pond down below that's known as Moorhen Marsh today because he was the first one to discover a, a common moorhen, which is now called a, a gallinule. 
nesting in this marsh. So um, it's an interesting natural area with cattails. And that same marsh pictured here, uh, this photo taken just about a month ago shows the new beaver deceiver, which is uh, um, an artificial um, uh, way of controlling water levels where beavers have such an impact on, on water levels in so many places, uh, either flooding or damming uh, certain systems. This particular system of Moorhead Marsh hosts uh, an incredible number of wetland nesting birds. That's part of why it's an important, uh, important bird area in the state. So uh, this beaver deceiver will maintain a water level that's desirable for these wetland nesting birds, which pretty much plop their nests at the base of the cattails. So, um, so a couple of the birds on this slide, um, top left, the Wilson snipe, and bottom right, uh, American bittern, both nest in that type of, of aquatic system, and they stand a better chance of having success uh, nesting as a result of that. So that's part of the, the management, and, um, and that is also a, a refuge that New Hampshire Audubon still has a role, as, um, as we are also a landowner there, too. Um, so lots of birds uh, get protection at Pondicherry, Scarlet Tanager, Black Throat of Blue Warbler, just a, another couple of birds where New Hampshire has a pretty significant number of these species that we have a responsibility to protect and manage. So, um, so those are just some of the 125 or more breeding birds that Pondicherry uh, protects, breeding species of birds. That, that's an incredible number. Um, so getting further away from Pondicherry here, um, you able to see my mouse? Yes. My pointer? Okay. Phil, so, do you, do you so, have a list yep. of birds that you, um, that you keep for this region? Yeah, there is a, a master list that's kept for Pondicherry. Um, I believe Dave is the official keeper of that list. But, um, but there's a great tool that anybody can use and contribute their own sightings. Um, and that's called eBird, eBird.org is the website. And it's a, another citizen science based way of contributing data and managing, uh, managing your own checklists and really a, an essential resource for anybody who's interested in birds. So ebird.org, check it out. Um, but yeah, the, the total bird species list has been growing every year. And it's probably up to about 250 or so at Pondicherry uh, of the 400 or more birds that have been seen in New Hampshire. Uh, ever. So the Pondicherry is up in this Connecticut River watershed area. Uh, we're going to venture up into the headwaters here next. Uh, so just this map's a little bit hard to see at this level, but it shows um, everything in blue here is parts of the Connecticut system uh, flowing down to the south through Massachusetts. Um, the upper right here, this kind of lighter brown color is, is the Androscoggin. And then there's the Saco. So three major watersheds emanate from this Coas County or, or north of the Natchez region. Um, so pretty significant uh, amounts of, of watersheds in New England come from here. And the Connecticut being the most significant is the longest river in New England at about 410 miles or, or so. Um, so yeah, so watersheds uh, and, and um, floodplains. Floodplains are very important. Um, we focus a little bit on those when I do uh, my tours up north. Um, I believe this one was taken in the Saco River system, but it depicts a, uh, a silver maple floodplain forest. So, you know, all hardwood trees, all deciduous. Silver maples are big, massive, multi stem trees. They, they have um, a lot of habitat value in their own right. And, and a lot of the plants in the understory are spring ephemerals. So, they have a short window when they can bloom and they attract their own uh, their own associations of species. So these are very important um, habitats in the state and they're they're really imperiled too because those are some of the most productive soils. A lot of these places have either been turned into um, agricultural fields long ago and maintained as such or developed into agriculture and then developed into um, uh, commercial or residential habitats. So you know, not really desirable uses for watersheds, which store floodwaters and have lots of other values as well. But luckily there are still some really large intact sections of the upper Connecticut and the upper 
Androscoggin and, and other intact areas thanks to the remoteness of this region and thanks to land conservation efforts. So some of the backwaters, uh, you may find some large stick nests. I believe even though these are a little bit grainy, the birds on, on the left are still identifiable as young great blue herons. Um, so uh, right now this is about the, the stage the herons are at in northern New Hampshire. Um, and on the right we have osprey, uh, a large stick nest. Um, you can see a couple of birds, a bird sitting on, on the nest and one above it, which is probably the male. So, uh, so just a couple of the, the species that will use these backwaters. Um, and then, oh yeah, these are not herons. Uh, I'm curious to know if anybody can guess what these are. They kind of have their, their heads in the, in the sand in a way. Any responses coming in? Sandhill oh. crane. All right, yeah. Yep, Nancy called it as a, a sandhill cranes. And these birds have an interesting story. Sandhill cranes are, are now uh, scattered as a breeding species in New Hampshire, but they all started from a single pair in Monroe along the Connecticut River Valley uh, in the Littleton area. Um, so a little bit of a side note though, um, for 15 years, a lone sandhill crane named, dubbed Oscar by the locals, was um, showing up and spending the summer in fields in Monroe in this little rural area along the Connecticut River. And one spring after 15 years, another crane showed up for the first time. It had a, it had a partner, it had a mate. Um, everybody assumed it had a mate. Um, nobody saw anything happening, but a couple of months later, uh, here was this young colt crane, which is the name of, of what a, a baby crane is called, uh, walking around in the fields with them, a little kind of brownish crane. And um, so Oscar and Olive, they were both given names, had a young crane and they were the first successful nesting pair of sandhill cranes in the state. Um, so perhaps now, now that we have a small population starting in the state, it's possible to think that um, it all started with Oscar, Oscar and Ollie. So, um, so now there are cranes also in uh, Lake Umbagog, but they're still a very rare species in the state. Um, that's just kind of an interesting feature that we'll sometimes make an effort to see. Uh, how about how long do sandhill cranes live? Well, that's a good question. I think um, I think everybody was a little bit surprised when they found out that the same crane was coming up year after year. It kept on coming. But you know, the bigger the bird, the generally the longer they live. So I suppose it's possible twenty or more years in the wild. But I don't know that offhand. So um, I believe they're still nesting in the area. So. Um, but, but really, cranes are a, a very much a side note to what happens in northern New Hampshire and its productive forests. So as we approach um, further north, some of the common southern birds, the southern breeders like the catbird and, and even species like um, uh, some of the warblers start to thin out. And we get into more of the, the hardwood dwelling species, the northern hardwood forest, and, um, and areas that contain spruce and fir forests. So top left here, oven bird, uh, going clockwise, um, yellow rumped warbler, hermit thrush, and gray catbird, just a, a selection of photos. Um, but now we're into the, the cold brook grasslands. This is another featured site of the trip. We usually spend part of a day or maybe parts of two days in this environment. It's a particularly scenic and, and um, pastoral setting with rolling hills, um, however, it's changed quite a bit, even in the short bit of time that I've been looking at it um, at, over the years. And that's due mainly to the loss of several large dairy farms. Um, that means the conversion of some of these large agricultural settings to other uses, such as second homes, large uh, developed or some developed areas, um, even Christmas tree farms, uh, you know, some other beneficial agricultural practices too. However, the loss of fields, you know, always kind of makes people sad to some degree, but it's, it's particularly upsetting because we lose the suite of species that has evolved with that, that habitat. So in this part of the state, um, what comes to mind the most is the northern harrier, which is a species of raptor that, um, that uses these open fields and, and young 
uh, young forest types as well and wetland areas for its nesting. And we think currently that there may be fewer than a dozen northern harrier pairs in all of New Hampshire. So it's a state endangered bird. Um, this is the first year in a long time that New Hampshire Audubon has been able to um, pull together a, um, a season project to study their populations in the state. So right now we have a biologist going throughout northern New Hampshire trying to document all the nesting territories of northern harriers and hopefully helping inform some of the management and maybe future conservation of these fields. So there is some hope for this area. Um, the federal refuge system has also stepped in with conservation of about a thousand acres called the Blueberry Swamp Division of the Conti Refuge. And that's in the towns of Colebrook and Columbia. So along with other um, local partners, uh, that's uh, a group that's helping to conserve and manage these landscapes. Uh, but I particularly like this photo here depicting um, fireweed in the foreground, which is just a favorite of mine. It, it really reminds me of Alaska and, and really the northern uh, areas of Canada. And, uh, and we do have fireweed and, and, you know, here and there throughout New Hampshire and uh, quite a bit of it in northern New Hampshire in August. So if you want to see this, with the, uh, the mustard in bloom behind it, this is, I believe was taken in early August. And these are just a, another image of what we do when we go around as a group. Uh, typically we're in a 15 passenger van. This year it's going to be a self-driving tour so we, we can keep distant and safe um, but looking at some of these old farm settings uh, it's a great place to watch bobolinks nesting some of these fields are, are dozens or even hundreds of acres so um, you know, large complexes of fields that have really good populations of grassland nesting birds too and uh, oh every once in a while we get surprised with the uh, sighting of a roadside bear so uh, so this, this particular bear has a story too, um, uh, and a name, so I'll get to that, but um, so we spotted uh, something dark, maybe a couple hundred feet from the, from the van, we pulled the van over, and, uh, and the group thought, is this a dog maybe, it looks like it's a dog, but no, then it put its head up, and it was a, it was a small, what we thought was a small bear, um, so it was out in the fields, um, some of the group uh, in that particular year was very interested in photography. They had their long lenses. At that distance they thought, you know, maybe they should get out of the vehicle so they can take some photos, but I advise them it's best to just, you know, leave the wildlife alone, take your photos through the window, let's stay in the car. So for about 15 or 20 minutes we got to enjoy this this young bear cub, uh, just kind of rolling around in the buttercups, munching on, on buttercups, and uh, and it was only then that um, all of a sudden, oops, all of a sudden, this massive mama bear got right up out of the buttercup fields, right next to this little baby. And, um, and this, this is the shot here that uh, somebody took, um, showing this big mama bear chewing on buttercups. You can see the yellow in its teeth. So that was uh, a fun experience. But you really go north to see moose if you're a, a big mammal fan. Um, I should mention though that bears bears are more common in northern New Hampshire than they are in the southwestern part of the state. Um, and, and a quick look on the Fish and Game website indicated they're about uh, 0 0.65 per square mile. Uh, that's black bear density. Compare that with about uh, 0 0.5 um, per square mile in the Monadnock region of New Hampshire. So definitely more bears in Coas County if you do want to see them. Um, but moose, here they are, uh, used to be the place to go to see guaranteed moose, to see lots of moose. Even 10 or 15 years ago, it wasn't a problem to just drive slowly down the roadside and see moose coming out. But I think many of us by now know the story of, of moose ticks and, and climate change and other issues that the moose have been facing. Uh, so it's not very common to see this fight anymore, unfortunately. Um, so typically, um, typically we're seeing mostly evidence of moose, uh, either in scat form or browse, 
uh, or antlers decorating somebody's archway that's leading to their camp. Um, or sometimes these unfortunate specimens like the one on the bottom right, uh, this uh, what you could almost call a ghost moose, which is so bare because of the density of moose ticks on its fur and its skin. Bill, there was a question about the other picture of the two. Sure. Could you tell us a little bit about more about this photo? Because those those moose look healthy. <laughs> they look like they don't have any ticks. Uh, I guess I'm busted here because uh, this this was taken out of state and out of country even. Uh, yeah, this this one was up in Quebec. So, uh, <laughs> but yeah, these these were pretty healthy looking moose taken about ten years ago um, in an area where I think they haven't been as as impacted by by moose ticks yet in the Gaspé uh, region of northern of uh, eastern Quebec. So, yep, mama and uh, and baby here. So uh, so yeah, unfortunately, moose not doing as well. Um, they still do appear to outnumber um, uh, moose in the Monadnock region by by a considerable number. Um, there are some good ways to see them, and we do see them on most trips. So. It, um, it should definitely not be out of the question to try to see a moose if you are able to join us. But um, uh, typically the spring is a great time because the moose come down to the roadsides for um, salt, um, salt uh, and salt on the side of highways. They also come down to the, um, the marshy areas to feed and on vegetation. So there are some great stretches to see them, uh, particularly around Lake Umbagog. The Pontiac Reservoir, and to a lesser degree in recent years, the Moose Alley, which is the last 10 miles of Route 3 as you approach Canada uh, in Pittsburgh. So it's unfortunately not a guaranteed sighting anymore, but we usually go out at night, do a little slow driving, and going around with the spotlight, trying to catch some eye shine. Uh, you want to drive slowly up there at night because they tend to surprise you in the road. Bill, have there been any programs to try and treat the ticks and help the moose populations out? Do you know? Um, hmm. I'm not sure that the state has gotten that far yet. That may be happening in some places, but I'm not aware of that. Uh, others on the, on the call here may be uh, aware of that, but uh, there is a long-term study that, that has been going on for a few years now in New Hampshire um, and in Maine to um, to track moose and, and to determine their causes of mortality, but I can't claim to know too much about that. So I'll stop attempting to now. But um, uh, but yeah, Pittsburgh, kind of the main destination here. I'll spend a few slides here looking at um, uh, the location that we stay on first Connecticut Lake in Pittsburgh. This is the largest of the Connecticut lakes, which are these dammed up reservoirs. Um, and, uh, and this is the view from the, the cabins that we stay at. So this year we'll be staying in some of these private cabins right along the shoreline. Uh, this is a view from the lodge, up the main lodge building. Uh, some, some happy participants here enjoying uh, birding the way it should be with the uh, Maybe a cocktail in hand and, and binoculars around your necks or on the deck. Um, but a great place to, to go and listen to loons, um, just to, to watch the scenery and the sunrise and, and you know, lots of lots of downtime when we're uh, on the first Connecticut Lake. This is a look at the cabins. Um, it's also the, the first spot the sun hits is this east facing shoreline in the fall. And that means really good warbler migrations right along the shoreline of the lake. The warblers are going after insects and they have to feed actively and, and, and in a frenzy um, for the first couple hours of the day in order to get enough uh, nutrition to survive and to migrate. So they're working their way through these spruces and birches right at high level sometimes. Um, so typically in, in late August, that's, that's near the peak of warbler migration. So that's, that's certainly one of the highlights of, of the trips here. Um, we also spend a lot of time just poking around slowly uh, on First Connecticut Lake, looking at, at the scenery, at the, uh, at the wildlife, the loons at that time of the year. There are several pairs of loons and they're done with nesting by then. 
They've, uh, they've either been successful or not, and they get together in little family groups, um, and they, they do a lot of calling back and forth to each other. It's, it's not always happy calling. They're, they're still fighting for territories, um, but it's always a, a spectacular thing to watch them. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about loons when I hit Lake Umbagog next here. Um, last summer, we had the chance to see this, this rarity. Um, I'll wait if anybody wants to chime in and guess what, what this interesting water bird is. It's not a loon, but similar. Any guesses? That's just a chance to see if you're still awake. It's, uh, Someone uh, guess, um, typed in grebe. Grebe, yeah. Okay. A red-necked grebe uh, in high breeding plumage. This bird, you know, on its way back from the from the high Arctic areas, uh, the, the boreal forests anyway, um, working its way back to the North Atlantic Ocean where it spends the winters. But these Connecticut lakes, uh, it's a fantastic place to catch a fallout of water birds that either belong in the high Arctic for nesting season or offshore on the ocean in the winter. So they typically only stop in large bays like, um, like the St. Lawrence River and you know, Hudson Bay, but occasionally weather events will ground these birds and sometimes there can be really large concentrations of uh, scoters, uh, different types of gulls, grebes, uh, ducks. So it, it can be pretty exciting on this large lake in northern New Hampshire, which is among the, the top five or six uh, largest lakes in the state. Um, there's also ample time for paddling. Um, these are not loons either. These are common mergansers. You can see a, a zoomed in photo of uh, a friend here was kayaking past uh, the lodge that we stay at. And this little common merganser family was uh, happily swimming by looking for fish last August. But we, uh, we use this as a good launching point for getting into the woods too. So um, we look for true boreal species, which are those northern boreal forest breeders, which means the spruce fir forest, um, birds of the, the dense woods. This is not your backyard chickadee, unless you live in Coas County. Um, and still, it's probably not your backyard chickadee. Um, this is a limited population of boreal chickadees, formerly known as brown-capped chickadees, because you can see the brownish instead of the black on the head. Also a little bit of a rustier coloration on, underneath the wing and a brownish on the back. They have a different call too, and they do mix in with black-capped chickadees, but much less frequent than black caps. So we, we really need to keep a sharp ear out to catch their call note, and then we usually can get a decent look at them. So, uh, so that's a sought after bird species up north. A um, little bit of a fuzzy shot here showing a family of crossbills. There are both red and white winged crossbills that occur in, uh, in northern New Hampshire, more so than they occur anywhere else in the state. Uh, and they're feeding on cones. So these are extracting um, uh, cones from different conifers. They have specialized bills that can fry seeds right out of the cones. So I happen to catch this family of red uh, crossbills, a male on the bottom left and two young ones with that fine streaking uh, on an October trip. So, so crossbills do occur in the Monadnock region too in the higher elevation um, in our um, spruce fir forests, but typically not your backyard birds. And then here's another uh, assemblage of um, northern breeders, uh, two warblers on the left, Wilson's on top, Cape May on the bottom, and then on the right, olive-sided on top, and yellow-bellied flycatcher. Uh, so those two are flycatchers. And these are all specialty breeding birds of the northern tip of the state. Um, typically um, boggy areas, and areas that have spruce and fir. Um, the Wilson's warbler is a little further north, typically in uh, willows and, and alder thickets. Uh, Canada warbler, a uh, very common species, <coughs> as the name might suggest. The male has that lovely black necklace and white eye ring. Northern water thrush, a um, bird with a, a loud song, sings from boggy sites. Um, it's more of a ground-dwelling bird. 
and, uh, and a handsome bay breasted warbler, one of my favorites, um, with its uh, the bay coloration underneath, um, really matching those, those red spruce cones that are growing there pretty nicely. So bay breasted warblers um, have a very high pitched song, much like the Cape Bay warbler. Um, typically only the, the trained ear that can hear really high pitched songs can hear them. So that's certainly not everybody, but we make an effort to, uh, to find those usually. And in spring, in June, when I lead June trips, that's, that's the best chance of seeing these guys in their breeding plumage. By August, many of the birds are a little more subdued in color, but, um, but still um, really nice to look at, not singing as much either at that point. And, um, and as we go further into this list of most wanted species, the, the species get more exciting, I think. The black-backed woodpecker, which is you know, really a, a small population, um, but very spread out and, and a bird that hides very well. It has a real bluish tinge to it too. You can see the, the bluish coloration when you have good lighting on this bird. Um, this species and the American three-toed woodpecker are very similar to each other. The three-toed is, is an even further north bird that hasn't been found in New Hampshire in about 15 years. Um, that's more typical of Canada and um, especially areas that have the fire presence. Do you have a oh, question? Oh, taken on one of your trips? Um, this was taken at Pondicherry by um, one of the participants on a um, World Migratory Bird Day field trip a bunch of years back. Yeah, I can't claim to be the, uh, the world's greatest photographer. I, I did take a lot of the photos in here, but a lot of the really great ones are, are not mine because I, I don't have the equipment and the, um, the stamina. I feel like it competes with my, my birding interests too much, but it can also complement your your birding as many photographer birders have, have proven. So yeah, that's a, that's a really great shot of a black-backed woodpecker on a balsam fir tree. And then the Canada Jay, which used to be called the Gray Jay. Um, it has a lot of great nicknames. Uh, Camp Robber or Whiskey Jack are two of the favorites. But these birds are super friendly. They come up to you, they'll land on your shoulder, on your head, they'll take food right out of your hands. If you've hiked the 4,000 footers in the White Mountains, you may have experience feeding the Canada Jays, which are, are accustomed to the hikers there. But um, the loggers in, in the Great North Woods think of the Canada Jays as the souls of old loggers who passed away coming back to visit their friends in the woods. So I, I like that, uh, that way of thinking about it when I have a, a Jay follow me through the woods. So the image here on the top left is a juvenile. I wanted to point out the difference between the adults, which is pictured um, in the center, and the juvenile or youngster on the top left. That was taken on, on an August trip that I led. And then the grouse. So two different species of grouse in the state, ruffed grouse on top. Um, they have the crested head. They're a little more reddish in appearance. They frequent the habitat uh, next to it, which is more of the um, early successional uh, old fields type forest. Um, and then the spruce grouse on the bottom right, um, they have the, the red comb over the eye, a little bit of a reddish band near the tip of the tail. And also the males have a lot of that black coloration in the feathers in the neck and, and upper chest. And that's a real specialty bird and perhaps the most sought after of the regularly occurring um, birds in the North Country in New Hampshire. Um, it, was, it was kind of a joke. I used to put this picture on all of my, my marketing material because for four or five years in a row, we would look really hard for spruce gas and we couldn't find one in all the places that you know, we had scouted out. Uh, it just has been a really elusive species for me in the past. And um, last August, we finally had a really good look at one in the middle of the road, which is uh, super exciting. So I could stop using that picture now. But, uh, but that one was taken in, uh, it was a male taken in October by Bob Quinn. Um, so Pittsburgh, the largest town in New Hampshire in size, uh, and is also supposedly the largest town east of the Mississippi River, although that may be fact-checked by somebody, so I'm not going to say conclusively. 
but it's a really large area of Coas County. Um, it's the northern tip of the state. And it used to be its own sovereign nation for a period of time. Um, <laughs> but Miles looks, <laughs> I caught you on that one, didn't I? So um, yeah, so there was a, a battle between Canada and the US for, for Pittsburgh. And um, they decided we're not gonna be ruled by either of you, we're gonna form our own country. So they called themselves the Republic of Indian Stream. So for, uh, for a few years, they were able to maintain that standing in um, I believe the, the early to mid 1800s, I don't have the dates, but uh, eventually they lost out and, um, and, and we got them back, America, the US got them. So, um, but this, this plaque here in Pittsburgh commemorates that Republic and this is the Indian Stream Cemetery, which has a lot of stones going back to that time. Bill, I missed a question about um, this, the bay-breasted warbler. Mm -hmm. Where did you see that? Well, there, um, that particular shot I took elsewhere. I took that one in Monhegan Island in Maine. Um, but they are a frequent breeder in northern Pittsburgh, in a place called East Inlet Road, especially. So if you want to see a bay breast of warbler in New Hampshire, your best chance outside of migration season anywhere in the state is to go to East Inlet Road and listen really carefully. <laughs> But uh, so in the Indian Stream area, um, in a particular landscape, um, we've had some, some good luck finding another state, uh, uh, state endangered breeding species. Here it is, uh, the cliff swallow, the rarest of New Hampshire's swallows, perhaps. Uh, maybe that, that rank with the purple martin, might, they might be neck and neck. Um, but a very limited breeding range. Um, they used to be a lot more widespread in the state, but um, they've, they've traditionally nested on old barns, old structures, bridge abutments, bridges, um, really on the side of something. They create this mud nest. Um, they, use, they use wet mud and they take it back up to the sides of structures and just plaster this conical nest with this entrance hole on the side. And that's how they do it. And they're colonial nesters, so they need uh, a population of close falls around them in order to be successful. And the biggest colony in the state is located in Pittsburgh at, um, at this particular um, farm called the Amy Farm, which is a, cons a conserved area. I believe the Forest Society has a conservation easement on the land. And um, we get to enjoy the spectacle of watching them feed their young uh, or make nests depending on the season that we go up. And uh, the adults look out and kind of squawk at you a little bit, but it's a friendly squawk. They're accustomed to people because they're nesting on the sides of people's houses. Um, however, a lot of historical places have um, have kind of disappeared in, uh, as nesting sites. So that's unfortunate. And New Hampshire Audubon monitors this species, which is now down to probably less than 100 pairs in the state, maybe half of which occur in this one particular house and barn on, um, in Pittsburgh. So we go visit this every summer. And it's a great experience with the farmer. He comes out and tells us how he um, he puts water in on the mud, so you know, so they have enough mud to nest on the houses, and they they make a mess of his house. But he doesn't care. He's a conservationist at heart, and uh, and it's worth the sacrifice to him and his family. So it's it's one of those great stories. So just a couple more scenes of Pittsburgh before we move on. I want to try to... Hey, Phil. Yes. Uh, this is Susie. I, I, I had internet trouble, um, but there was a question about um, protected lands in um, Coas County. How Good, is it, yeah. What's conservation like up there? I'm glad somebody asked because I, I was uh, remiss not to say that. Um, yeah, in, in 2004, 2003, 2004, there was a huge land conservation project, which is um, now protects about 200,000 acres of Connecticut river headwaters through conservation easement lands. Um, it was a purchase of land uh, from the um, ver various federal and state sources, as well as the Trust for Public Land. So private, it was a real blend of, uh, of strategies in order to raise the, uh, you know, the hundreds of, of millions, I believe, that it took to conserve that amount of acreage. Um, 
and this huge effort was successful in protecting those Connecticut lakes um, from development along the shorelines and keeping um, forestry as a as a mix in the um, in the in the economy in that part of the world. So, outside of the White Mountains, the White Mountain National Forest, which is about 800,000 acres, that represents the largest conserved area in the state. Um, so, aside from that, um, yeah, there's a mix of Forest Society, um, TNC, some of the some of the big statewide players have land, as well as um, uh, some smaller land trusts, but. The Connecticut Head Headwaters Project is really what's significant in that part of the state. Thanks for asking. So uh, just a few images from up this way. This is Scott's Bog, very close to the Canada border. Um, really beautiful protected area. This contains um, a natural area as part of that Connecticut Headwaters Project. There is an area that's going to be unmanaged forever. So 15,000 acres, I believe. Uh, just in view within this um, photo uh, is, is areas that, that's set aside from any sort of um, any sort of trails or recreation. It's just set aside as wilderness. So that was kind of one of the neat things. They set aside maybe 25,000 acres in all for wilderness designation. Um, a couple more North Country things here. There's a blurry photo of, I believe, a mink frog on the right. Uh, and on the left, um, I'm sorry, I can't show you a video of this, but uh, a bumblebee going into uh, bottled gentian, which is a really neat thing to see in, in August. Um, you could watch the bee go completely into the flower head first, um, coming out with pollen, back, backing out of the flower, and actually turning around in the flower and then going out head first. Um, it's a neat thing to check out at the end of the summer. Um, and then a wacky creature here the Cecropia moth and Cecropia caterpillar. Um, really a strange looking creature, but it's one of the large um, uh, silk moths. So it is a great place to see bugs, um, all types of bugs from black flies and mosquitoes to the, the larger sphinx moths. Um, uh, no better place in the state, in my opinion, to see lots of insects at night, uh, maybe like you used to see when, when you were younger. It's a group photo there in front of Moose Falls Flowage. And here's East Inlet. So there are some truly spectacular scenes. And here's my Bigfoot sighting. Not really a Bigfoot, but here's my New Hampshire Bigfoot sighting in the East Inlet area a few years ago. I was scouting for one of the trips with Bob Quinn. And right in front of our vehicle out in the, in the wilderness area, um, as we were approaching the wilderness area, we got to see uh, Bigfoot himself, <laughs> the Canada Lynx, hop right in front of the vehicle about 50 feet and um, it only stayed for a split second. But we were quick enough to, uh, to hop out of the car and, and you know, wait for any, any evidence of it to come back, which it did not, and then to go out to the exact spot we saw it and um, do our best to get a photo or some photos of its impressions. And, that was the best we were able to do as far as tracing it, showing where the, um, the toe pads and heel pads were. And by the size of it, there was, it, it could not have been a bobcat. It was, um, I'm sure Susie could tell us the exact size, but I think something like a four inch width of the, uh, from toe to toe, and maybe three and a half inches in, in length. So Canada Lynx back in New Hampshire now. It's breeding. Um, it has been videoed uh, as, as breeding, so young are moving around, and it's great to see that species make its way back into the state from the north. There's a castle in New Hampshire. This is the Balsams in Dixville Notch. It's been closed for a long time, but it's still something to stop at and, and have a gander at when you're there. Um, there's a loon swimming by in the foreground. And, uh, and there are also some, uh, some natural spires of some interesting geology in Dixville Notch. You can hike up to Table Rock, which is uh, a really breathtaking and harrowing place to, uh, to 
perch out on the edge, looking down at the balsams. We don't do this, rest assured, with the group. Um, it's, it's really not for the faint of heart, but um, um, a great mountain experience if you're in that part of the world. And speaking of mountains, um, a couple of times I've taken the group up to Mount Washington in search of a couple of uh, rare bird species that can be found up there. Um, here's the observatory on a beautiful clear day. I think this was a June trip. We went up to see the, the American pipits and Bicknell's thrushes. And this is the Krumholtz region where the, um, the Krumholtz is where the trees don't grow that tall, even though they may have been there a long time. These spruces and firs are windblown and are only well, slightly more than head high at that um, elevation of about 5,000 or, or higher feet. So we look for the Bicknell's thrush, which is a rare breeding species that nests in New Hampshire's White Mountains um, in greater density than anywhere else in the Northeast. And it winters exclusively in the island of Hispaniola. So this is the place to come for them. Uh, also a great place to see the Black Pole Warbler, a uh, long distance champion migrant of the songbird world. It goes thousands of miles to and from its, uh, its winter home in South America, flying over water for three days in order to make that flight. So each fall they need to fatten up. Uh, they have to be about twice their weight in order to make that flight. Uh, but they breed up in the high elevations. So Mount Washington, Cannon Mountain, those are good easy places to, to find them if you are a little bit more limited in how you can get around on foot. And, and finally, Last but not least, I wanted to take you through Lake Umbagog a little bit, um, which is um, uh, one of the largest lakes in the state. It straddles the New Hampshire main border uh, in, around the town of Errol, and um, it's surrounded by hills, but it's, it's really wildlife central at Lake Umbagog. Bald eagles uh, last nested there before they vanished due to DDT, the chemical that limited them. So in 1949, the last nesting eagle was on a particular tree in Lake Umbagog. Um, it took 40 years, but 40 years later, certainly not the same eagle, bald eagles returned to the same tree and started their rebounding population, which is today now at about 72 pairs in New Hampshire. So, so, um, so Umbagog has some great success stories with eagles, with ospreys, which um, used to have a real core population there. Uh, common loons. Um, the Loon Preservation Committee studies common loons, and there are several pairs on, on Bagog. Um, thanks to banding and, and um, telemetry with loons, the researchers have been able to tell that loons primarily winter between the Gulf of Maine, the Maine coast, and Long Island Sound. So those are the loons that breed prim primarily in New Hampshire and Maine and southern Canada. And a little fun fact that our loons in New England are much bigger and heavier than the loons that breed in central Canada and up into Alaska. Um, so those loons have had to evolve to fly much further. So their bodies have become smaller evolutionarily than New Hampshire loons. So a great photo of a back riding chick there, which uh, only happens for the first few days or so of, of the loons lives. A uh, couple more fledgling uh, broods here of American black duck on top, ring neck duck on the bottom. Umbagog really is a spectacular wildlife viewing experience, especially if you can get out on the water. We take a pontoon boat ride every year in order to see them. Um, and I'll show you an image of that in a bit right at the end. But just a few bog plants while we're talking about Umbagog, which has spectacular floating bog mats. Um, this, this photo here was taken at Moose Bog, just over the border in Vermont. Um, bog cotton, uh, pitcher plants in the foreground. Sundews, one of my favorites, a carnivorous plant, which eats tiny flies. Um, and then uh, a smattering of other bog plants, including the, the beautiful Rhodora, which blooms in May. Um, so yeah, back to Umbagog quickly on the main part of the lake. Um, so each, each year we do a sunset boat tour 
with a complete dinner out on the pontoon boat. Unfortunately, we won't be doing that this year due to social distancing. So we're going to miss that experience, but hopefully we can get back to that and enjoy our, uh, our wildlife viewing experience. And, uh, and as the sun sets, I realize we're coming up on the end of the time frame here. So I wanted to leave a little time for some questions and I wanted to put in that last plug and, and see if anybody wanted to join me this year or in future years. Um, at this point, the trip that I'm doing in August is almost full. There may be one or two spots left and limiting group size but uh, feel free to email me about future trips too. And with that, I can take any questions. Thanks, Phil. That was really that was really cool. Some surprising information. Okay. Hey, Phil. I have a question I'm, for you. I'm here too. Um, my question for you is: Any idea um, why um, cliff swallows are declining? Yeah, good question. Um, I'm glad you asked too because uh, cliff swallows are in the group of birds known as aerial insectivores. And this group of birds feeding on insects that fly around uh, is declining more than any other group of birds in our region. Um, and that includes nighthawks, whippoorwills, uh, many of the flycatchers, and many of the swallows, even barn swallows, are showing long term declines. Cliff swallows have, have really declined in, at alarming rates. They used to be fairly widespread. They even nested, you know, in the Monadnock region and in several places. They no longer do. Um, and that probably has to do with insects being in short supply. Uh, it also could be some complications of climate change that we don't quite understand completely. Uh, habitat loss is another big thing when it comes to bird populations in general. Um, so those are those are three chief factors, I would say, but cliff, cliff swallows in particular, I think um, their reliance on certain types of structures, um, a lot of those places are, are going away or excluding them too. So it could be intentional exclusion uh, because they make a big mess. They're colonial species. So we really need to do more to protect them, but we need to really understand what's causing that decline. So. It's complicated with aerial insectivores, but uh, I'd say all of those reasons and then some. Yeah, so um, there was a question from um, Robert. He was wondering, have you noticed a drop in bird population in general in the last 10 years or so? Hang on a second. Um, I'm gonna ask you to repeat that in a second. Sure, yeah. Maybe Phil's having, I had technical problems. I think it was this weather related. Yeah, it's me. <laughs> okay, Phil, do you want me to repeat the question? Oh well, yeah, please. Sure, yeah. Um, Robert was wondering if you've been noticing a general decline in bird populations over the past 10 years. Well, yeah, that's a complicated question too. Um, I'd say overall, yes. I think it's, it's clear, you know, a lot of the big studies that have come out in recent years, uh, in, in the past year even, uh, before, COVID took up all the news. Um, the global bird decline uh, was a big factor. The three billion birds lost in the last 50 years, according to um, several prominent uh, international groups. So overall, bird populations are declining. However, there are winners and losers um, within that, that group of you know 500 or so bird species that regularly occur in North America. So breeding bird trends in New Hampshire are also showing long-term declines for many species. However, we're getting some new ones that are coming in from the south also. So a mixed bag, but a um, great place to find out about that is on the New Hampshire Audubon website. Um, I believe our new state of the birds is supposed to be coming out very shortly. So that will dive into all those factors. So good question and Hopefully more answers in the new state of the birds. Yeah, great. Thank you, Phil. 
Um, so lots of people are thanking you in the chat, Phil, and thank you. It was fabulous. And Miles, you did a great job kind of um, giving people information. I know, do you want to just share, Miles? There's lots of questions about where people can find this if they want to um, review it or, or listen to it again or share it. Yeah, sure. So we recorded tonight's presentation and it will be posted to our YouTube page, which I, I posted a link in the chat to the Harris Center's YouTube page. Um, you could also just search for that in Google and, and find it that way. But uh, yeah, it'll, it'll probably be posted sometime next week. It'll take me a little while to process it. Great, thank you, Miles. And I'll just say, if you enjoyed hearing Phil um, t this evening, um, I do wanna just put a plug in for Ask a Naturalist, which will be happening July 23rd, 5.30 to 6.30. Um, Phil is often on our panel of experts and always has great answers, not just about birds, but in uh, about other things as well. So you can catch Phil again. And Phil, do you have any last words you wanna end with? Oh, just that it was a pleasure to teach you about my favorite place in New Hampshire, I think. Uh, and maybe this will encourage you to, um, to consider a trip up there on your own or with me someday. And I'd love to show you some of my secret favorite spots. So wow. thank you, Susie, and thanks, Miles, for facilitating. So thank you, Harris Center. And well, thanks to everybody who showed up. We had 67 participants at one point, which is pretty amazing. Um, so thanks, Phil and Miles. Thanks for holding down the fort. Anytime. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.